select board meeting for November 1st, 2021 to order. Uh, first motion is to approve the agenda, unless there are any changes. I'd like to add a liquor license for Maxi. Under consent. Under consent. I would like to add two items, um, potentially. First one under select board business, item D, parking issues on Stowe Street and Sweet Road. Mm. And then Linda, uh, he's got to turn off his speaker. Yeah, you're echoing, Bill. Um, yeah, Carol, I can't, I can't hear anybody. So either I just shut the computer off and I just deal with this by phone, but. We can just mute I him can't right hear now. Mark through the phone. Yeah, okay. We're just mute him on the, the phone, on the phone and then. Okay. He can also mute um, What do you want me to do? Just mute him on the phone. He can listen to us when we need to go to him. We'll go to him and... Hold on, hold on. Him. I'm listening to you and Mark <laughs> at the same time. Hold on. What do you want us to do? It, just mute him on the cell phone and when we need... When we look to him to discuss something, he just needs to turn his speaker off and then we unmute him, I think. Conversely, Carla, might I suggest he actually mute himself? That way, if he does, we'll right. speak up and we don't. Yeah, no, we won't know if he wants to talk otherwise. Okay, when when you're not speaking, mute your phone. Okay. Shall we try it again? <laughs> yep. Let's Linda, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Linda, I see you on Zoom. Are you hoping to talk about your email today, or were you, um, were you in any kind of position to talk about that today? I can give you a summary. Okay. Um, if, this is a, if you want more detail, we can line it up for the next meeting. How's that? That's fine. Do you mind if I put it towards the end of the meeting, or do you want us to move it up? Whatever you want to do. All right. I'm just going to add it as item E, if that's okay with everyone. Hey, actually, Mark. Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, is, is there a chance we can move up the uh, the banner thing um, so okay. that people, people that are attending can go home at a reasonable hour? Sure. All right. So we're going to move C up to the front of select board meeting. Yeah. And then, Is he not on mute? No, you're not muted. That's awful. Um, and then item D, parking issues, still street, sweet road, and E, um, an internet update on a new option for Waterbury. Um, any other changes? Just on E, was this sent to all select work? I don't know. It might not have been. But it's um so I'm not familiar with mentioning that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um uh, she'll be able to tell you what, okay, what's going fine. on. Okay. Um any other changes? Can I get no, any I make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. I'll second it. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Consent hey, agenda can item. Can stop for one second? I'm sorry. Yeah. I can't. He was on a speaker conference call earlier. With e I can plug that back in. Okay. Bill, can you hear me? Why don't I try to plug back in the conference call phone and call you? And just help me get off the computer? Yeah. Alright. Alright, I'll try to put that in and call you in just a minute. Sorry. I think we can move forward. He doesn't need to be out. Right. We can do consent okay. agenda items with him. Carl, do you care if we go through consent agenda items without him? Nope. Uh, consent agenda items. Minutes from October 18th meeting and the liquor license for Maxis. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? I'll second. Right. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Um, public, uh, this is an opportunity for anyone to speak from the public that's here tonight. Um, preferably not on an item that we are going to be talking about later, but if there's anyone here that wants to discuss any other item, now is your opportunity. Is there anyone that wants to speak on anything that's not on the agenda? 
Zoom? Let's forget it. Hello? There we go. Bill, can you hear us? I'm here. Okay. Can you hear us if we're talking at this level? Um, it's difficult, but I'll make it. We'll talk up. How about now? Yeah, that's, that's good. Okay. All right, first item of business is to discuss the inclusion banner continued discussion from last week. Um, there was approval for a banner, but we did not, and it was going to include the wording from the inclusion statement. So tonight we're hoping that we can move that banner design forward. Um, <coughs> Mike, I think. A copy of this. Um, so the one that I think we are currently landing on is water right condemns racism and welcomes all on the banner, which basically is the first sentence in the inclusion statement. Um, anyone have any comments on that? No, I think each of us internally have said some things and I think this kind of crystallizes both um, the Black Lives Matter movement, racism in general for all parties as well as uh, announces that Waterbury is a welcoming community which, which is what the Declaration of Inclusion is about. So I have no problem with the one that we have somewhat sort of agreed upon. I think it fits in terms of spacing. Anything too wordy is hard to read. Um, it was important for me that it was not just inclusive, but actively anti-racist, which we get with this. Um, so I am for this wording. Do you see that? I don't know if the... Chris, any comments? Yep, I'll get to you in a sec. Can you run that by me again? At, at just yeah, a little difficult hearing you. Yeah, it's basically the first line of the inclusion statement, which is water bay condemns racism and welcomes all. So that version came from where and? That's the beginning of the inclusion statement. As it, uh, the, the inclusion state, declaration of inclusion that we adopted? Yes, it's the first line. So you, what are you suggesting? That that be the banner? Yes. Yeah. What do we need to do? What are you doing? Bell's on. All right, am I in now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, if that's what the, if that's what the declaration that we adopted said then. Carla, can you bring that up? Um, Is it possible? Or can I? I guess I don't have a problem with it. Um, I'm gonna go to the public then. I don't need, do I need to bring it up? <clears throat> yep. Uh, should I just speak from here? Um, sure, can we, does that pick it up or does the owl pick it up? I think, I think we have to be at the I think they would have to sit at yeah. yeah. the table. Okay. Hmm. So um, I guess my first question is none of us have seen it. Um, so is there a way we can put it up? It's right there. Mm -hmm. This works well. Okay. And what's your name? Could you state your name? Yeah, my name is Maggie here. You should pass this around so people can see it. Um, so I, I live here in town. And I think one of, well, I have numerous concerns about this whole process. But one of my concerns is that this, that all of this <clears throat> seems to be coming from one group. And we're a community, so I'm wondering why community input isn't going into a banner. I'm wondering why there's not a collaboration and um, you know a filtering of ideas. To me, this is negative. You know, the first thing I get coming into town is we're condemning something. We're not. We're not saying. You know, Waterbury is a great community, and you all should want to come here. And we can't wait to have you here. All of you, we're condemning. It's the very second word. Waterbury is condemning. This is the banner we're talking about, right? 
Yeah, and we said we I understand, so but I think you also months. said at the last meeting that again, only one organization drafted that, and you um, you approved it. So again, it went through a select board meeting. It went through a select. We board agreed meeting. on it, and mm -hmm. we voted it in. Mm -hmm. it, it was amended. It wasn't quite word for word what the group that presented it. All right. I think what I'm trying to say is how much of the rest of the community knew this was happening or had input into the wording or had any input into this banner or the previous banner and and that's my question why is this not a community collaboration instead of a almost mandate or dictate or Top heavy. presented from one group of people in the community um, I think Waterbury is a great community. I absolutely love living here. I love what I know Waterbury to be. But Waterbury is not condemning. It's not a condemning community. And I don't think this is the first thing we want people to see coming in to the community. So that's my, that's my initial statement. Um, so I'll just ask you to consider that and I might have more to Can say. Can I make a comment back to that? Sure. Um, I was one of the ones that uh, last meeting we voted to not allow an additional banner. But we, everyone in this room who attended was very firm that we do have this declaration of, of inclusion, which has been around now for months. No one's created, had, I don't think anyone who is a reasonable thinking person can object to anything in that declaration of inclusion. And this just says, I, I understand what you say at first, but it does condemn racism. And I, I don't have a problem with anything that we say, because I think we do condemn racism. I don't think anyone, can, could anyone say they support racism? I don't think so. And again, it says we welcome all. So I think it is, it, it's making an affirmation that we do condemn racism, but we do welcome everyone into this community. And I don't think it's a negative against anyone. And again, people can attend select board meetings. And to be honest, if people have problems, they need to speak up, they come to the select board meeting, not at the ninth hour. We agreed to have this declaration two weeks ago we said we would have wording. That's what we're here today. I don't have a real problem with what, what, what's there. I, I propose something a little bit different, but we as a select board, we, we, ha we can't speak as a group. We even have to email each other one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Mark proposed that. I saw that. I thought it was a very good representation. Again, it comes right from our Declaration of Inclusion, which we were all behind. In, in the spring. So to say that that doesn't represent the community, if people in the community had problems with that declaration of inclusion, where have they been from the spring till today? I didn't know anything about it. Yeah, and I, I will let oh. other people speak, but I, I think that's no, I think, Yeah, and I, I will second that, that I think this is a negative. You're drawing attention to something that I don't feel is necessary to draw attention to. That's assuming that people are racist. That's assuming that people are I don't, racist. I just, I, I'll just disagree with you. I don't say it's we condemn racism. It's not saying we have racist people. I'm not Why are you drawing attention to it in this way then? That's, to me, that's what that's doing. I guess we're, I, I'm not going to argue with your point. I'm just I saying, think a lot of people feel that way. I think a lot of people feel that way. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mark. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is there a reason we can't introduce what Mike had uh, come up with? I think it might take the harshness out of what uh, the last two comments were. Um, yeah, Chris, because um, I think that where the impetus for this banner came from is anti-racism. So it's not the 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 um the purpose of the banner we're discussing is not just a welcome sign to the town, but um, 
a, a strong statement of inclusion and anti-discrimination. So simply to say we welcome all takes away that purpose of, of actively um, condemning or finding another word of, of being actively anti-discrimination and anti-racism. <clears throat> Just in full disclosure, my initial, what Chris was referring to, my initial uh, statement for the banner was Waterbury stands for inclusion for all. And I still think what Mark came up was as good if not better because it does make an affirmation. And this is something that has been approved in our declaration of inclusion. It's just like, I hate to say, if people don't know about it, they're not following town government, this has gotten a lot of press in the Waterbury Roundabout, the Waterbury Reader, probably other publications. Uh, I don't think this is something new. And I don't think it is a negative. It's just an affirmation. Uh, that's my piece. Yeah, I'm just trying to follow the procedure. Yeah, the last I know last week, week so. we, uh, <laughs> we were lining people up a little over there. Um, I know we were lining people up, so I think I saw your hand first, so I'm happy to, okay. I'm not like to speak first on that. Um, first of all, thanks, and we appreciate the fact that this is being brought to our attention as a community. Um, a few comments that I'd like to make. Um, you mentioned that it's it's an impetus, to, uh, isn't anti-racism, or it is anti-racism, anti correct. Um, I thought the impetus was to, um, what was about inclusion, making people feel a part of, rather than making people feel like they're not a part of. And although I understand that this came from your uh, declaration of inclusion, I do think that it does, it does have a negative connotation. And I do understand your point, and, and you can see it differently. Yeah. The problem is that some people will see it as being a negative rather than a positive. I wish it said, Waterbury welcomes all, because that is an, inclus an inclusive statement, right? And there isn't a negative connotation to it. I understand that, that the group that has really been pushing for this is about anti-racism. And I would say that um, I, would, I would think that at least 99% of Waterburyites um, are about uh, anti-racism. But to have the word racism be in that, in the way that it is, does again seem to, to have a negative connotation and, and that's the concern that I have. The other point that I want to make is I've spoken with a number of people, at least a half a dozen, who absolutely do not want um, a BLM banner up, which I know this isn't the discussion right now, but they are literally afraid to speak out about it. And I think that's really sad that that's where our community is at. And I don't believe anybody here wants it to be that way. I don't believe it's one person against each other. I think it's everybody wanting some peace in this crazy time that we're living in. And so the last thing I'd like to see Waterbury do is put something up that's going to cause more division rather than bring us together. How, is this, how, how does this create division in your mind? It creates what division because, it, because everything that we're hearing about lately, we're super focused, hyper focused, focused on racism to the point where that's, it's, it's, it's being used so much that it's losing its meaning. It's just constant racist that, racist that, you're racist. I mean, to be called a racist doesn't even mean what it used to mean. It used to be horrifying. Now it seems to, again, have been become politicized, which is horrible, because it is horrible to be truly racist. So, again, a lot of opinions, and I understand that. I would just like to see us do something that is inclusive, that feels inclusive, and that doesn't cause further division in our town. So, that's my piece. I just 
just want to say to you, if you really feel so offended to hear the word racist or racism, I'm not. A, oh no, I'm sorry. No, there are the words in my mouth. They should be. I did not say that. You had better calm down, sir. Okay. Okay. You had better calm down. All the order. All the order. So, I just want to speak. First of all, I want to. I want to thank you all. I want to thank you all for. Um, adopting the statement of inclusion that you have done. Um, the last meeting, I'm kind of very surprised to hear that the same folks who are here and were here who were advocating and saying Black Lives Matter is not inclusive, that we need to do a banner and adopt the statement of inclusion. Those same people who advocated for it, not or against it tonight. It's very clear to me. And I apologize if I'm going to get emotional. But it's very clear to me that the problem here is the fact that people have issues with the words racism or saying that white people stand against racism or condemn racism. If that's offensive, God damn, please imagine living it. Imagine experiencing it. Please. If, 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 if the saying if we stand against racism or we condemn racism is offensive or hurts people, I just want you to think about what it is to live, Joe, to experience me. racism. Excuse me. Order. excuse me. He's speaking. You I want you to think about what it is to experience racism. Do not assume. Excuse me. He's, it's, his, it's his opportunity to speak. <laughs> I will not have anyone speak over anyone, okay? Everyone will have their opportunity to have a couple <coughs> minutes to speak on this, but I will not have anyone speaking over each other like that. I will just not allow it. And if I have the right, I will remove people from this meeting. I just won't have it. I'm sorry. This is a select board meeting. This is a meeting of the He's select going board. Into Excuse a me. Boohoo session right now. A boohoo session. Excuse me. Okay, this is What's supposed to be. Can we remove right people now? from the meeting? Bill, you're muted. No boo-hoo here. This is a Excuse meeting. Excuse me. Well, you, can, you can remove people from the meeting. You probably have to call the police to do it, but you can remove people from the meeting. All right. I will remove people from the meeting. Do not speak over other people. Allow everyone <clears throat> to speak. Maroney is speaking. Go ahead. And I just want to say, first of all, when I talk about this issue, I just want people to know I may have moved here in Waterbury. I may be new to some of you. But my father is from here. My father's Bill Mentor. My family's been here for 25 years plus. I did not just move here to try to create a problem, or as you all of you trying to make it seem like I'm attacking you. When I talk about racism, it's not a black or versus white issue to me. My father's white, my mother's black. I get it from all sides, from white, from black. So please, I'm begging you. I'm not trying to make this about you and me. And don't do that. Talk to me, get to know me. People are calling Waterbury Area Anti-Racism Organization as an organization. This group that I co-founded, what we stand for, we're not a Black Lives Matter group. What we stand for is clear. We're trying to make this community an inclusive community where anybody is welcome, regardless of their race, gender, economic background, religious, or who they love. If you go on our website, that's what it is. Black Lives Matter is one of those movements that we have adopted to understand and recognize the struggle that black lives people are going through. It's not to say that nobody else's life doesn't matter. When I say black lives matter, it does not mean that my white father's life does not matter. It's to recognize the struggle that black people have gone through and continue to go through, the brutality from police and the killing of black people. That's all. That's not to say that your life does not matter any less than mine or any black person. So please, let's try to come with an understanding of what that really means. Let's have a conversation. 
there is an education component of this that needs to be done. And I welcome that. And I just want to finish by saying I really appreciate the fact that you have understood last time a lot of members of the community, including Waterbury Anti-Racism Coalition member Kim, as much as we advocated for the Black Lives Matter flag to be up there, in addition to the, this uh, inclusion statement, we have no problem with this. This is, as you, everybody advocated, we want to do something that comes from the statement of the inclusion the town adopted. So I'm very disappointed to hear tonight that the people, the same people who advocated, who asked you to do this, are against it tonight. But I'm here to say that thank you so much for doing this. We have a lot of work to do in our community. And let's come together and do the work. And I think this is a good step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Are you coming up to speak? So, my name is Angela Wells. Um, for those of you who don't know me, and I've lived here and raised my kids here for 30 years, and I married a hometown boy. <clears throat> so, I get, <clears throat> excuse me, what people are saying on both sides. And I think that if what we're trying to do is promote honest, direct, direct your comments to the board. Honest, heartfelt discussion, especially with our children, um, to change things. We want <clears throat> to have some type of banner that is opening and welcoming. I think that where we are generally over as a society is when people hear sometimes the word racism, they're like, oh, I don't want to talk about this. It's uncomfortable. And it should feel uncomfortable because it's not something that, you know, it's an uncomfortable thing. And in order to grow, um, we have to discuss uncomfortable things. And when I think of racism, I think of the color of your skin. And I think that what we need to be talking about and growing and discussing and educating and opening up about includes more than that. It includes um, the LGBT community. It includes different religions. It includes people who suffer um, and, uh, horribly from mental health issues. And there are a lot of people who are new here and don't remember when we had the state hospital. And it was the norm for us. You know, the gentleman spoke at the last meeting about how welcom welcoming and accepting we were of our, you know, citizens who were residents of the state hospital. So I get what both people are saying, um, and everybody's passion is noteworthy and is rooted in what's traumatic and what affects them the most. I, I would like to see it be more welcoming and, and that feel good, and then it opens the discussion of things that are uncomfortable. Does that make sense? I would love to see the inclusion statement on a beautiful sign when you come in to our town. I think that the overall inclusion statement is wonderful and something more permanent. I think that those posts are supposed to be to, or were founded to advertise events, and I think if we stray for that from that, then we kind of get in sticky waters. Um, so I can understand what the people spoke before me, and, and I absolutely respect their heartfelt feelings. I do agree that it, I would like to see something more welcoming that, that people can take a breath and then that starts the conversation that maybe digs into what makes us feel uncomfortable and what we need to work on from ourselves, from our community. I think, but I do agree that the in-your-face approach, while that might work for some people, I think that if we want to open up thoughtful, heartfelt discussion on something this 
you know, that's a horrible, racism is horrible. And we, we want to be welcoming to all. I think you get a better buy-in and you get a better response of, of opening versus, you know, people feeling. And, and I agree that it's an overused term that kind of waters down how much work needs to be done. So that's just kind of my feelings that maybe if we, if we make the banner where people are coming in and people are seeing that, it, it maybe it will spur more thoughtful discussion in a more gentle approach um, that, that really helps people really change versus being too in your face where people will close off and, and not want to have that uncomfortable discussion, if that makes sense. Gina Callen. I grew up here in Waterbury. First one in my family to be born and brought up here. So, um, and I have to say that my mother was best friends with the only black family in town at the time, the Boyds. I don't know if anybody remembers them. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. Never even considered racism. Never even a, was a word that we even knew growing up. So. Um, but since you're talking about an inclusion statement and Waterbury, I mean, ideally I would love to just see all are welcome. Um, I'm not a technical person, so I haven't gone on the internet. I don't um, do Waterbury roundabouts. So I didn't know anything about this, but somebody informed me of this meeting. That's why I'm here. Um, but just listening to the conversation and wanting to have something maybe more inclusive um, and hearing the words that I thought would be very welcoming, I just wanted to propose that you could say something more appropriate like Waterbury affirms, because I love your word of affirmation, <laughs> Waterbury affirms inclusion, all are welcome. So I really appreciate that you want to make people feel welcome, you want to, you know, put a kibosh on racism, and you've all learned about the inclusivity program that is going on around the state. So I just thought that would be very appropriate. Waterbury affirms inclusion. All are welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Flora Scott. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm a writer and I used to review plays and I used to <clears throat> tend to try and make my point using really strong words and just with that, everything everybody said, it's reminded me of my editor always telling me if you use negative words to make a point, you're going to con, you're going to get a negative reaction. People, it's, they're hard. You know, they're hard on your heart, they're hard on your ears. People don't like to hear negative words. They're painful to hear. And I think that everybody has the same goal here. Nobody wants racism, but there's a lot of division and there's a lot of people being called racists that aren't racists and, you know, it's blown up into this crazy thing. So I think, you know, just to kind of stand on the shoulders of people who came before me, I think positive words are gonna have the effect that we're all looking for. You know, the affirm word um, is good, but um, condemns and racism, I think, are just really harsh and negative. And while it certainly makes the point that you're wanting to make, they're ugly words, and they cause ugly reactions, even if your intention is for a positive one. So I'm gonna stand with the people that came before me that um, we are against racism, but let's do it in a more inviting way. 
because we're trying to invite people into our community, and so we want to do it in a positive way. And say that, you know, using making the same point though. Thank you. I'm Duncan McDougall, and I wanted to say that if uh, anyone feels that uh, Waterbury is a completely non racist town, um, it doesn't recognize the fact that there are, there's racism throughout our country. Uh, in all towns. Uh, this is an issue that has existed for hundreds of years, and it's an issue that hasn't been fully solved, in part because our society hasn't really taken a hard stand on it. And for years, we've been using quiet, soft language and not really addressing the fact that racism uh, is all around us. And when I hear people say that this proposed language, Waterbury condemns racism and welcomes all, is not welcoming. I think, in part, it assumes that the people who are reading this statement are the ones not affected by racism. So there are people who, in their day to day lives, in a variety of levels, a variety of ways, experience this. And they would be the ones who read this and view that as a positive thing, not saying, Waterbury is taking a stance on a very challenging issue. And I have no trouble having that wording there. Waterbury condemns racism and welcomes all. It covers both sides of that. It shows people who are experiencing this terrible situation that we're taking a hard stand on it. And I think as a society, as a country, it's time for us to really take a hard stand to make it very clear. Um, because I think when folks say, well, I'm not racist, um, there, there are a lot of different ways that in day-to-day -day life we don't realize the actions we take, the words we use, whatever it might be, has an impact on folks. And I think this takes an appropriate and strong stance, and it's a stance that as a society we probably should have taken a while ago and might have gotten us a little further down the path than we are right now. Thank you. Thanks. Dave Goodman has raised his hand. What's that? Sorry, not Dave Goodman has raised, raised his hand. Sure. David Goodman, go ahead. Hi, um, this is Sue Minter, wife of David Goodman, and I uh, am a resident of Waterbury, have lived here for 30 years, uh, raised my children here, and I'm the very proud aunt of Maroney Minter. I also served on local boards of the Waterbury, uh, the Planning Commission, I served in the legislature representing Waterbury for six years. I served in the executive branch and I now run a, an anti-poverty organization, Capstone Community Action, which among other things supports our food shelf and housing insecure families. I wanna say uh, thank you to the select board for advancing uh, this wording of this banner. Uh, I understand that you have had a lot of response to the initial banner. You've worked hard to create language that considered uh, the, the strong wishes of the Black Lives Matter uh, folks advancing that banner, as well as folks who felt that maybe there was a lack of inclusion, uh, inclusivity in that first banner. So to me, this is really um, a way to bring the folks, the concerns of those who had formerly spoken with concerns about, I guess, the tension behind perhaps the Black Lives Matter flag to bring it to a different level. Uh, to me, this advances the concept of inclusion as well as recognizing um, and condemning racism, which is extremely important and valid and as important and actually the foundation to the need for a statement of inclusion. I want everyone to know that it's not just Waterbury, that communities across Vermont and even the state of Vermont is really um, working hard to think differently about where we go from here as one of the whitest states in the nation, a state that desperately needs new, especially young and more diverse people, uh, a place where 
we are desperately trying to bring new workers to fill unfilled jobs. Restaurants are closing, organizations, child cares. And part of what we need to address is the fact that at this moment, there are many who don't feel included. So I believe that this statement is eloquent and I strongly support this select board um, raising this as a way to both celebrate our community, our fantastic community, the resilience of this community, and yes, raising the fact that racism is an issue that we condemn while we include and welcome all. Thank you very much. I'll turn this to my husband, David. Thank you. Um, I also want to um, appreciate the select board in speaking for so many of our community who view this as a statement that they would they feel proud of. They feel proud of our community for acknowledging everyone who lives here <clears throat> and acknowledging that racism is here as it is in every community. And we're a community that's saying to all of our residents, we see you, we hear you, we care about you. And it strikes me that a lot of the conversation is often, it's based on one's own experience. If people are fortunate enough to not experience racism because they're white and they are beneficiaries of a system that has advantaged them, well, that's a very nice place to be, but to acknowledge how racism has profoundly impacted many members of our community, including my nephew, Maroney, uh, who I think has been very eloquent <clears throat> in speaking, not just for himself, but for many of us in the community who want to see, you know, when I see this sign coming into the community, I will feel welcomed and embraced. I will feel that it speaks for me, but most importantly, that it speaks for everyone, not just for representing you know, one's own experience, uh, but the experience of everyone and letting everybody know that they're safe here, that they're welcome here, that they can be their full selves here. They don't have to not use words like racism. When I hear that, you know, people are concerned about um, using a word racism, I think really we need to be concerned about experiencing racism, not naming it. And by naming it, we're acknowledging a lot of our community. Um, and we're letting them know that uh, we want them to thrive here. We don't want them to be feel that they can't be their full selves. So I think this will be a great opportunity for Waterbury to really position itself as a leader and, uh, and a welcoming leader. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I too have a concern about the folks who are so vehemently opposed to using the word condemns racism. Um, if we said Waterbury condemns thievery or Waterbury condemns terrorism, would we be worried that we're offending thieves or terrorists? And racism in one degree maybe isn't um, criminal, uh, but we do have laws on the books to try to promote um, uh, everyone's civil rights. I think that, you know, if we can't use the word condemns, we could say Waterbury affirms that racism is abhorrent. Is that any less of a, a, a stimulus to get people thinking or talking? When we say that we want to include everyone and we, we don't want to be offensive to those who are uh, in the LBGT community, we don't want to be offensive to other groups who feel maybe that they're um, not given uh, enough protections or enough right to their own space by society. Um, in the one hand, that's awful, but on the other hand, it's only people of color that are different just because of what they look like. Um, you can't usually tell just by looking at someone 
that they are of a of a, a group that feels in need of some protection. And I think that we're worrying too much about who's gonna be offended by this. Um, if somebody is truly racist, having a banner up that says Waterbury condemns racism probably isn't gonna make them change their mind. I think what we're looking to do is to get people like me and, and most of us here to say, wow, I wonder why we have to have that sign. How do I behave in my daily life that may telegraph that, if not racist, that I'm insensitive to other people? So I really think that we're splitting hairs here to say that using the word condemn is, is too uh, egregious. It, it is something that I condemn. And I, I would hope that the town, the vast majority of people in the town condemn racism. We're trying to move the ball forward to get people to talk about this issue. And if we sugarcoat everything and can't offend anyone, then nothing is gonna change. It takes being shaken up sometime to say, boy, I've got to change how I behave. So I think that you board members, uh, you know, this is a representative democracy. You've allowed a lot of people a lot of time to talk about this. You're elected to do what is best for the community in your minds. And I think that you can, you've got to take everything that has been said and consider it and sift it through, but you can't make allow the community as a whole to make every single decision. You're elected, this is, you're speaking for the town of Watery. So uh, this is clearly your decision to make. And I think that you should, I know that you're taking it very seriously, but I wouldn't let the word condemns racism uh, think that that's gonna push too many people away. There might be people that don't like it, but, I think the vast majority of people are going to say, boy, um, why is it that we need that? And, and think about it in a productive uh, uh, fashion. So with that, thank you. Um, I think we're going to give everyone just one opportunity to speak so we can, because we have other items on the select board tonight. Steve, are you looking to speak? Yeah, I would like to speak. <laughs> So uh, you all know me well. Um, uh, you may not know, uh, we have three children of color. Um, our all, older daughter's Afro-American. Uh, they're all mixed race. Um, so our children experienced a lot of racism growing up in Waterbury, um, starting in kindergarten, maybe even before that. Um, and as parents supporting them, we experienced trying to support them when they were bullied or excluded. Um, and, you know, whether it was in the kindergarten classroom, in the hockey rink, uh, being called the N-word, uh, retaliating because they were angry, getting punished because they retaliated. So these are the kinds of experiences that our children grew up with, still experience at times uh, as adults. So, um, so racism is, you know, in our society and all of us in one form or another. So I think having a statement is great. I've got a wonderful picture that I took of the Black Lives Matters banner and the Vermont Lights the Way under it. <clears throat> Twilight, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of that picture that Waterbury had the courage to put that up as what people saw when they came into Waterbury. I think it represents our community of being bold, challenging people, and I commend you. Uh, we can argue about, about wording, but I think it's racism, it's talking about racism that offends people or makes them uncomfortable, and it should. We need to be uncomfortable because people who experience it are made very, very uncomfortable and it can be traumatic, it can be very troubling for them. So I just want you to know what my experience has been as a white person with uh, kids of color and trying to uh, 
live through that. So thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Mark? Yep, go ahead. So while we were hit, sitting here having this discussion, I, I don't know if you had sent your versions of, or any of you have sent your versions of what you thought might work uh, to everybody prior, but I just, you know, I just was looking at what you had put, Mark. I think we're close to a, a, a consensus here. Um, you know, everybody on both sides have had good comments, uh, good concerns, but when you brought this um, first version to the table, Mark, you, you, you never brought the second one. And I was kind of wondering, because after reading it, I said, you know, I like the second one better than the first one. And I don't, yeah, what the hell? You got to be you referring to, you know, Chris. you guys are still there, but they are just yeah. Right here. yeah, Chris, I'm not sure what you're, you're referring to. Maybe you're referring to yeah, there, I'm Mike. Not. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yep. Oh, I muted. Oh. No, we can hear you, Chris. We can hear you. I don't think he can hear us. Anyway, I just wondered. I can't hear you now for some reason, but um, I was wondering why you didn't bring the the second version to the table uh, and and compare the two. Um, because I way prefer the second version, which is basically the same, but it leads into the whole issue. Chris, not can you hitting hear people us? quite so hard, you know, um, but yet still makes the same statement. I, we don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Chris, do you hear me? No. I think he's referring to, I can't hear you. Yeah. I'm referring to, yeah. Right. right. Sure, thank you. <laughs> my, my name is Mallory Culbertson. I live in Waterbury. Um, I think it might be useful just to sort of remind what the point is of a banner like this. And it's um, obviously everyone who sees it uh, when you're coming into the town is going to read it and have some sort of feeling about it. But the intention behind it is to make people who don't normally feel included make sure that they feel included and know that they're safe. Um, you know, we live in a time when, uh, unfortunately, um, people of color often don't feel safe in a lot of towns, especially small towns. And to create a banner um, that specifically says, you know, we condemn racism, we want you to be safe here, uh, we affirm, you know, every aspect of yourself and we want you to be here, uh, I think is a lot more powerful than something more generic like, you know, welcome to everybody. Um, so I think it's just important to sort of remind uh, everyone uh, in the board that this is a banner that is meant to make sure that people of color especially feel safe in Waterbury um, and to telegraph that safety. Um, yeah, again, I think watering down the message to make it more palatable to more people has the counter effect uh, that a very bold statement of, against racism has, it, to water it down will make people feel less safe. Um, so I, I hope that, um, uh, I don't know, resonates. Um, I'll also say, um, as, a, as a community member, and I've heard, uh, you know, people bring up the LGBTQ community, uh, you know, as sort of a, almost a counterpoint. Um, uh, this isn't calling to that as a local, queer community member uh, in an interracial relationship, uh, seeing very clear language condemning racism makes me feel safer as a queer person because if you are a community that stands very firmly in anti-racism, in my mind, that means you're probably also standing very firmly against other kinds of oppression. Um, and I really encourage the select board to maintain uh, firm wording you know, against racism. I like this language. I would have loved to see the Black Lives Matter banner back, but if we can't have that, um, I would love as a community member to see this banner up. Um, yeah, and thank you to everyone for speaking and being vulnerable. I know it's hard, but um, I think it helps with this sort of public debate. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you much. 
Anybody have any other select well, I have a, I, Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> thank you very much for letting us speak tonight. It's a great way to say thank you to the United States of America for allowing us all these opportunities to express ourselves. I have two comments. Uh, it's, my name is Barbara Walton, and I, I live in Waterbury Center, and I've been here for probably 40-plus years. My husband, Jim, what is very much involved in, in zoning. <clears throat> Brother, I call him Brother Walden, so sorry. <laughs> uh, you heard it from me. <clears throat> Anyways, I have, I have two comments. One is uh, I'm confused on uh, the, re the minutes. Did we keep the two-week period of having an event banner? That never... No, this was a voted forward about our, our agenda item that was to put a banner on the banner poles okay. from basically whenever we finalize the wording until, okay. until okay. town meeting. Right. Okay. We weren't about to change the banner regulations. The, the bylaws. The bylaws. Okay, that, that clears up. Right. But, but, but the banner pole is town property. Right. 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 Okay. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to mention is I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, sometimes I always feel that we follow bigger cities and how, how they do their things. And it was great to, because I know you mentioned Burlington and Montpelier, what they were doing. But I really have a sense that what we're doing here is really the town of Waterbury. This is what, as a community, we are doing and not following some other city's path. And the other <clears throat> third comment I'd like to make, and, and I, I think I had a great um, um, spirited comment uh, with um, uh, Moroni's uh, father last meeting. It was really, really quite, um, you know, enlightening when, we, when I told him why I did not like the signature of BLM on a, on a banner. Because when I see it, I see only destruction, I see protests, I see a burning of buildings, I see people injured. And so that's, and I don't want it focused on that. I'd like, this is a fantastic, you know, uh, and declaration of inclusion. Uh, whether you put condemn or a, another word in there, I'm just glad it's going up. And that's the way we, we welcome people. There is one, I had <clears throat> several comments from people when I was talking to them about coming to the meeting. And they said, no, we're not coming to the meeting. I said, well, why not? It's a great way to get input, excuse me, input. But what they found was it was intimidating. It was intimidating that if they truly say something that is, you know, uh, uh, against another person's feelings or that, that they will be intimidated in, in, the, in the town. If it's a business, they'll be protested. There'll be, you know, uh, uh, negative remarks made about them. And I said, well, that I don't. That may be true to them, but I said it would be nice if you came and listened to uh, people speak. Uh, and so that's the reason I don't like BLM. Not that I don't like Black Lives Matter. And I'm sure you've gotten this comment many times about it. And, and when I, it was reinforced, when they said they felt, no, if we come and speak, we feel that we would be looked upon and would we get retaliation, especially if you own a couple businesses or you own a business, that that, that can be um, hurtful, uh, especially profits, you know what I mean, <laughs> as a businessman. But anyways, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I want to thank you for letting us know and while you talk to people you can continue to encourage them to come even if they don't speak and listen yeah and the reason that we and Mark particularly is working so hard to make sure this is an atmosphere of respect we are working to do it orderly again we're a small town we never know how many people to expect things run a little differently each meeting and we're working on making it more organized but that's why it's so important here not to talk over people, not to be loud and disrespectful, because we want you all here. We want to hear what you have to say. It matters. It may not be, you may not know that all the time, but it does matter that you're here and giving your opinion, and we want you to feel safe 
and we want you to feel respected, and that's why we ask for a respectful atmosphere. So the more we can continue to create that, the more people that, like Barbara's talking about, will come and be a part of the meeting. And we need to be mindful, though, that sometimes the language on both sides can be um, not encourage um, conversation or dialogue or um, uh, communicating well with each other because some people do do start off wrong and will initiate a negative response from other people. So it just needs to be, you know, we need to be aware of that. Keep working on it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny, for your comments. Yeah. Thank you. Any additional comments from the select board or I will entertain a motion. I just want to say something real briefly. Um, I hear the passion on both sides. Um, I'm very respectful to folks on both sides. I understand that the wording is, I wouldn't want to say harsh, it's, it's to the point. And I'm for that. The only thing that where some people have said that it doesn't create a welcoming is if we, and, and this is, I'm not necessarily for this, but this is just an idea, if that this will make things a little better, is, there's the thing, it says, just flip it around and says, Waterbury welcomes all and condemns racism. That way the positive is front. But I really think it's important or that we make an affirmation that we do condemn racism. I think that's really essential. But I'm okay with it the way it is. I'm just curious to hear the other select board people's comments on that. That was one of the, that was the language I originally proposed, but mine was a little too long. Right. Um, but it, it started with Waterbury welcomes all and condemns racism. I think I had it and discrimination, right. which was too which was too long. Um, that's why I made that comment to right. you. I kind of, if a banner you want something there, right. make a statement and not, you know, we could put the whole declaration of inclusion, but people <laughs> are gonna drive right past that. And, and maybe <laughs> that's something we should have is a, 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 plaque. a plaque out in, in the lobby here of our declaration of inclusion. I think that, that could be important because that would tell people, this is what we, we Waterbury stands for. And we have discussed this so many times, and I know there have been thoughts both ways, uh, but I stand by the Declaration of Inclusion. Yeah, as do I. I. I understand some of maybe the comments tonight, and I do think it's important that this banner does spark conversation, and I don't think we should try to lighten it or soften it. I just think that that that's only just speaking to the problem and I do agree with a lot of the comments that like we have to be we have to come hard and strong with a message you know at one point I heard the multiple multiple people use the the term stand so at times I considered should we say Waterbury stands against racism and welcomes all that being said I really do think that a strong message from our community saying that we condemn racism is is an important one I don't I don't want to reword it and reorder it. Um, I support it. Um, I'm a business owner in town. I sit here and support this. Um, it's sad if anyone somehow sees that as a negative. You know, I just, I don't think that there's anything in this messaging that isn't appropriate, um, especially in the current, current climate that we, we see. I have multiple people, um, approach me talking about um, racism they've experienced in this town. I don't, I don't believe that we're free of it. And I think this is, and it, you know, it's just maybe a small minority that experience it. And we as a community need to stand with them and stand up against it. So I'm completely fine with what the wording is. Um, if someone wants to make a motion and move it forward, I'm completely fine with the proposed. Um, I move to adopt the wording as is and move forward with the creation and hanging of this banner. 
Do I need to do the time? Do the dates? No. Do the time? No, okay. Is there a second? Second the motion. Any further discussion? Yes, Mark. I didn't get a chance to chime in. All, all I asked was that you didn't um, put forward the second version, and Danny kind of, and Mike both kind of <coughs> uh, uh, made reference to it. Um, I do prefer Waterbury welcomes everyone. Everyone, we condemn racism, racism and discrimination. Uh, I would prefer to see that just from the point that number one, it's welcoming first. Uh, and I think that the point of um, we condemn racism and d d discrimination is just as strong after that, but first it's welcoming everybody into town first and then making the statement that uh, yeah i understand what you're saying um any select board members want to change the wording good either way i do a little bit like the idea of the welcoming because it still gets in that we condemn racism and that to me is the most important point that we make that statement that we condemn racism and I hear some of the people who want it to be a little more welcoming. I hear that, and I can really go either way. I'm fine as is. Okay. I'm fine as is, too. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? So we're not changing it, is what you're saying? Correct. Or you no. leave it? I can't hear you, Mark. Yeah, we we voted it forward, uh, yay or nay on your end. As okay. It is. To, to make the change, you mean? No, no. We're, we're not changing the wording. Um, so the motion was Waterbury condemns racism and welcomes all on the banner. It was moved and seconded, and then we voted on it. So it's a yay or a nay. Would you like to vote, Chris? Yeah, I'm going to vote nay only because I prefer the other version. Uh, you know, I mean, it's going to pass anyway, so uh, I just prefer the other version. Okay. I'd like, that. I'd like that get put in the minutes too, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you all for your input. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving, on. moving on to the next. Hey, Chris. Yes. Um, I understand you prefer the other version. I also think it is much stronger if the select board is unanimous in this. Would you consider voting yes on what your colleagues voted on and then also saying, I, however, prefer the other version? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Good point, Bill. Good point, Larry. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Thank you for everyone who came in to speak on that tonight. Moving on, discuss proposed legislative reappointment. Bill? Well, this isn't really my issue. I did send out uh, an email the other day to all of you just to kind of frame the issue. Um, <clears throat> as I indicated, the governor appoints an apportionment board or a reapportionment board, uh, and the board has uh, made a recommendation. And Carla has it, I'm sure. Uh, I don't have it with me, but um, the, uh, the, um, the the proposal. Yeah, the, go ahead, Carla. This is the email about we potentially lose a representative based so on population. So this, the, this is the proposed redistricting. Loss one is uh, about 4,500 residents of Waterbury. There's about 5,300 now after the latest census. Chittenden, Washington one proposes that this line right here is Little River Road. 
that these 750-ish Waterbury residents be in a district with Bolton and Huntington. Carly, can you skip, share your screen? Oh, I thought I was. Hang on. In the middle. Green button. Yeah. Yep. Green button. <laughs> Try double clicking the green button. Huh? Just <laughs> double click button. the green button there, Carl. This green button? Yeah, if you yeah. Just yeah. Hit double click it. You can pick yeah. what you share. And then pick your map. Yep. There you go. Double. There you go. Okay. Uh, you can just sec. So, I'll start again briefly. <laughs> the new proposal, so currently, Waterbury, Huntington, and Bolton and Bulescore are in a district district with two member representatives. The latest proposal is that Washington one district be about 4,700 Waterbury residents. This line here is Little River Road, or Little River, and that people in this 750 residents be grouped in with Bolton, Huntington, and Bulescore. The interesting part is that they, when they made the determination, it's not just <laughs> so weird. It's not just west of Little River Road. It comes up U.S. Route Two, west. And they grab half the. And they grab half the village or all former village. They come up by the river. The they grab the, the west side of Winooski <coughs> Street. They go up Main Street, and they grab the west side of Stowe Street. No. And back around by the That's interstate, so you get Butler Street and Wallace Street and Intervale. These, they, they include, they are included in that 750 people west of Little River Road that we lumped in with Huntington and Bolton. And each district would be a one member representative district. So is, right. is it, oh, go ahead, Bill. Well, no, go ahead and ask your question, Mark, first. I'll comment after. Um, I mean, I guess the question is, is who's the driving force and are we, is it to make a statement at, on behalf of the select board that we would potentially not support this or is it because this is not voted on at a local level correct right so the, this will ultimately be the legislature's call the legislature gets to uh do the redistricting um i think on wednesday or thursday this week the board of civil authority is meeting to discuss this and the select board as individuals, each select board member is a member of the Board of Civil Authority. So the, the question really becomes, does the select board as a whole want to make some recommendation to this Board of Civil Authority? Now, in my email, I just want to be clear that from a purely um, egalitarian fairness point of view, single districts are the most fair uh, way to apportion the legislature, that each legislator would be responsible to represent about 43 or 4,500 people. That if you divide the state of Vermont by 150, the population of the state of Vermont by 150, each representative should represent about 4,300 people. The legislature has never really like the idea of carving up towns such as is proposed here, where you know um, a very minor um, uh, population number of a town be segregated off of the rest of the town and cobbled on to some other district. And the reason, of course, is that you know Waterbury residents have much more in common and their interests are much more similar as Waterbury residents than they are with Bolton or Huntington. So for those 750 people that get cobbled out of um, the, the, the current configuration, uh, they, they lose identity with their townsfolk, their fellow townspeople uh, in the legislature. Um, so the legislature has in the past decided that some districts are better served by two member districts. Now, from a fairness point of view, when I was in Island Pond, I had, you know, I was the manager of the town of Brighton. Brighton had one representative. Uh, and if there was an issue 
I could call that one representative and people in Waterbury could call two representatives. And I felt, hey, that's not fair. Waterbury's got twice as many votes as, uh, you know, twice as many people to call as I do. Um, but the legislature and the Supreme Court has viewed that as a legal means of representation. So, so, I, so that, I, just let me finish and then I answer a question. Um, but there are some towns like, I think Barry Town, certainly Barry City, Montpelier, they're large enough to be represented by more than one representative, but rather than have uh, a, a two member district like Waterbury has, those communities are divided up and, and the members of their community uh, still have a representative that is probably from their town or close by. So the issue here is the segment of the population that gets cobbled on to uh, the other district is a concern. So I'll stop there and then see if anybody else has questions. Do you know about how many other um, populations are, um, have two representatives or are the two are joint? I, I don't I don't know that Danny, and as I said in my as I said in my um, memo, even though I personally favor single member districts and I think that's the fairest way to do it, if the legislature is going to create two member districts and Waterbury gets cobbled up this way and ends up with one representative, then we really take a hit in our influence in the state house because right now we have two reps if we if we get put into a district like this configuration is uh we'll only have one so if everybody in the state had one i would feel less concerned about this than than i do now if there are going to be two person districts two representative districts i think well, Waterbury probably deserves to be one of those. Now, there are some other issues with this that I have to be careful about because I'm, I'm not a politician and I can't take political stands. And this is really, this is politics at its best. This is kind of called gerrymandering. But <clears throat> right now, the way they've drawn this, they draw it right down the center of Winooski Street. Um, and the people on the west side of Winooski Street, the Dacro Field side of Winooski Street, if you will, they get lumped in with that district in Huntington. <clears throat> the people on the right side who are in the green on the Hope Cemetery side of the street, they stay in the Waterbury district. So it looks like they've gone out of their way to not only have one representative in Waterbury, but they've gone out of their way to put both representatives that Waterbury currently has in the same district. So one of the two representatives that we have clearly would not be able to be elected. Um, you know, I'm not sure I would feel much less strong about this because I think they are weakening Waterbury's position in the legislature, but if they included all of Winooski Street in the uh, in the Huntington um, Bolton district, and those people were, you know, it turned out to be 850 people instead of 750 people because they took the whole side of the street. Um, well, at least the current representative of Waterbury would have a if he desired to run. I don't even know if he has a desire to run or not, but that would allow the current representative, somebody who represents our town right now, could at least run. The, the likelihood is that, um, you know, if you've got Bolton and Huntington who have thousands of people and uh, 800 people or so from Waterbury, the likelihood that somebody from Waterbury is gonna get elected in this new district is slim anyway. 
but it just seems like they've gone out of their way to uh, make sure that one of the two Waterbury representatives doesn't get represented here, uh, doesn't get reelected. Is, is anything similar to this happening in other towns where they're like sort of cutting it right in downtown? I would yeah. imagine. Uh, I don't know. I have not seen the whole redistricting plan, Danny, but, um, you know, I'm, and you know, this, this is, this is politics and, and there's nothing, there's nothing evil about it. It's, it's politics. That's how, you know, the, the constitution is written. The legislature gets to draw districts and we see what's happening in other parts of the country that districts are being drawn to, to try to reduce the number of, of people of color who get elected. Um, and, you know, whether it's a, a, a good or a bad thing to do isn't, isn't the issue. It's a legal thing to do. And if you've got a legal challenge, if you think somebody's violating your civil rights, you can, you can fight that in court. I don't think this would be, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I think that this is something that somebody, if they objected to it and took it to court, there would be a low likelihood that they would prevail on this. I think they would say the legislature has the right to draw its boundaries based on the census information it has. And if the legislature thinks that this is okay, it's okay. Now, the current representatives in Waterbury are still part of the legislature now, and they get to chime in on this. Um, this doesn't go into effect until uh, the election of 2022. So <clears throat> the legislature that is seated now, that includes the two representatives from Waterbury, will be the ones that ultimately will decide this. Um, but the apportionment board, this is the proposal that will first be presented to the legislature. Um, and the question is, do you think this is in Waterbury's best interests? That's really the decision you have to decide upon now. Bill, oh, thank, thanks first of all for your eloquent quick uh, email describing <laughs> the situation. I think that was excellent. I'm concerned, I'm actually against both proposals because I do think inherently like you kind of presented, Waterbury does, is created an unfair advantage. Just think if you're from Huntington or Bolton I hate to say it, you're screwed. You know, someone from Waterbury is probably going to get voted in. You're probably not going to have the representation that you would if you would have a representative from your own area. But I don't agree with chopping up Waterbury into two sides. You, you know, it just makes no sense. You know, I, I know it's we like the idea that we have two representatives, but... <laughs> It's really not fair to some of the other towns, but conversely, I don't think it's fair the way that they've apportioned it to segregate our community the way that they did. I think there's probably a better solution, and I'm not saying I'm going to propose a better solution. I might have a better solution. You know, I you know you probably have to look at the maps and something like. I think both solutions, pardon my French, suck. Well, the. I think in my memo, I said that there's a 10% um, leeway either side. Carla sent me an email this afternoon, and it's really 5%, I guess. Um, so to me, it would be much less problematic, even if they, even if they drew a line in a position that would make the two existing representatives run against each other. That's not my, that's not my main concern, but they could probably draw, draw a district that split Waterbury more in half and combined each half with other towns and Waterbury would still probably have the ability to maybe elect two people to the legislature they would represent half of the town, but this just kind of cobbling off seven or 800 people, um, I think that is a, that's problematic because those seven or 800 people don't have anywhere near as much in common with Bolton and Huntington as they do with the rest of Waterbury. So it's, 
It's not that they're cutting Waterbury down to size, so to speak. If they can, if they could do it in a fashion that uh, left, you know, even fifteen hundred people in one of the districts and and the the other, you know, thirty five hundred in a different district, I would feel less um, offended by it. The fact that they're carving off seven or eight hundred people that to me is where the issue is and then of course the blatant like okay let's make sure that they the two representatives have to be in the same district i mean there's no other reason to draw the line right down the center of winooski street than that so what's the course of action then is it that we are we uh, are you thinking we write a feedback letter and pass it to the whoever they are that are drawing the maps, or no, do we, we give it to our local reps? The BCA I has would, to make I would make a recommendation to the B, the BCA, which is to tell the BCA that we've looked at this, we think that it's not in Waterbury's interest, and we would advocate, uh, you know, for them to try. We, we would hope that you would advocate against this in whatever communication they have. And Carla is much more in tune with the BCA's responsibility than I am. Back in 2010, the last time this happened, um, there was some proposal to uh, do away with the two-member district. And you know the BCA took an action and actually wrote a letter. I don't have a copy of the letter, but I'm sure it's in the BCA's minutes someplace, but this has happened before. Carla, can the BCA take a position that I'm against the 750 people being carved off, but I'm also, I understand how Huntington, Ewell's Gore, and Bolton feel too. They're discriminated too. And, we may have a little bit in common with Bolton, but we have no nothing in common, I think, with or, or very little in common with Huntington and Beals Beals Bar. Yeah, well, and, ten ten years ago, the Waterbury district was it was a two member district, and it was Waterbury and Duxbury, and I don't know if there was anything else other than Waterbury and Duxbury. And when they uh, when we had to reapportion in two thousand ten the BCA advocated strongly to keep Waterbury and Duxbury in the same district and not go with Bolton and Huntington because at least with Duxbury, we had the Harwood Union Supervisory Union in common and it's even more in common now. So, um, uh, you know, and I don't know who they put Duxbury with, but uh, we weren't happy with the result last year because we didn't think that we had a lot to do with Huntington and Bolton. And as Mike said, you know, there's, there's, there's not going to be a perfect solution that makes everyone happy. Somebody's going to be redistricted out of the ability to run or out of the ability to be elected because they're going to make two incumbents run against each other. It's going to happen somewhere. The question is, do we want to just take no action and say, eh, let the chips fall where they may? Or do you want to say this isn't in our best interest because and make a statement? That's all. I mean, there may be some people on the board who think this is a great idea, and that that's okay too. Uh, I just, you know, felt it's my obligation to just frame the issue for you. That's all. Chris, can you see what's being proposed on your end? Yeah, I read through Bill's memo. I'm right on board with Mike. Um, you know. We've been, for lack of a better word, privileged too long, I think, uh, when it comes to the three towns. We've had, you know, the two representatives from Waterbury, and uh, it's time to, I think, share. It's unfortunate, though, that we got to chop off just that minute part of the population there to make it work. Um, I wonder if there's another way of uh, finagling that. Yeah, and, and that's the tough part. There's no way, you know, we, we might be able to have the ability to draw some lines on the map that satisfy us, but you've got to do it for the whole state. That's what the, the issue really comes 
about. So if we draw different lines completely for us, I think that I think it's just a statement that um, while we understand the desire to go to a single district, we're concerned that the the proposal as is for Washington one and Chittenden Washington one is um, is not in the best interest of the residents of Waterbury because we don't you know those 750 people really uh, are excluded from folks who uh, who they really have uh, much more interest in so uh, I, I don't think you can propose a new line necessarily but um, uh, I think you can say that if you think that it's it's not good you can say we don't we don't like it and we request that that uh, you redraw these lines somehow. Can we say, because I know I see Duxbury's in Washington 11. I don't know what the population of Duxbury is, but boy, we share a lot more in common with Duxbury than any of the other potential options. And I'd be someone, you know, I'm not real. I don't think, I think I could firmly stand as a select board member against that 750 uh, person division going into the Chittenden Washington one, but I think as a solution, I don't know if, we, you know, I know it's probably going to create a whole bunch of other dominoes if we kind of joined up with Duxbury again. And I'd be curious to see if there's some political, uh, you know, buy-in by Duxbury that they would like to go into our district again. And would that make, I don't know what the numbers are. I don't know that the BCA has the expertise to try to redraw the lines. I understand. We can certainly express our concern if we have decide we have concern as a board with the current configuration. Yeah, I'll just throw out a couple of numbers all around all around them. You can see for the Chitton and Washington district, the yeah. um, the apportionment board says that ideally a one member district is like 4,300 people. Right. And a two member district is about 8,600 people. So Shitton and Washington 1 have 4,000, so you have a deviation of almost 300 people. Washington 1, you have 45, almost 4,600, so you have a deviation of 300 people. Over. If, we, if we have our current two-member district, the deviation is 21 people. So that means something to me as a math nerd, but. Yeah. <laughs> so to clarify, so, so we are not in a position to recommend a, any sort of solution. We are only in a position to say we're for, if we want to say we're against it, I just to, to say that, right? I get that clarified in our meeting on Thursday. Okay. It's just also, like Mike said, stack of dominoes. Once we start playing right. lines. Right. All the yeah. other things. That's I why like, I just want to get clear. What I like what Bill said. Right? It's just a letter saying we're, you know, we don't like what we see and we suggest that they revisit Or you should what's come to the meeting on Thursday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to just object it totally because, like I said, I think we've been hogs for too long and it's time to give up a representative to the other two towns. I mean, that's just the way I feel. And I'm attempting to try to get um, uh, information from the Huntington and Bolton BCAs. Uh, their meetings within the next few days, I think. So I'm going to see. So, where... Carla? Yeah. Carla, when you Carla, talked when about, talked the, about deviation, the deviation. I'm assuming, I'm assuming that, that the, deviation the deviation in Washington, Washington one, one as a single, as a single member, member district, district that were 293 people too few. Few. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. And in Washington, in Washington Chittenden, Chittenden, Washington, Washington one, one, one there are 300 yeah. people, yeah. Too, people many. too many. Yes. So, so at the very, at the very least, least, you know, if they're going to be insistent that we do this. Do this Probably it would be nice, would be nice if, they if they took 300, took 300 more, people more people out of water, water, water so they could so move, they could the, move line the line down Main down Street, Street or, they or they could draw it so it would include the whole village, the whole village or, something. or something. But, but um, um, you know, you I know, think the I think problem, the problem and, it's and it's clear in my mind, they're, they're, they're trying, trying to leave, to leave they want a they line that has the two Waterbury reps in the same district. So one of them doesn't get elected. And if we and if we if we have if to we have, have a single, have member, a single district, member district, and there's, and there's deviation, deviation of 300 people between, between the, two, the two, instead of having only 
700, 700 people, people from Waterbury, from Waterbury be, put be put into that, into other, that district. other district. Make it a Make thousand, it a thousand people. people. And, and, and at least, and at least there's, there's a thousand, a thousand people, people from Waterbury, from Waterbury that, that have the have same representative, the same representative and, they and they can have a little have bit a little more, bit of, more a, of, a, of a voice. Of a voice. Uh, I'm, not I'm not suggesting that, that should be the be solution, the solution, but, but I, I think I that, think that at the very at the least, least, if, the, if, if we're going to end up with our population in two single district districts, in two, in two single member single districts, member districts we, should we should have each district, each district be closer, closer to the ideal than, than they're, they're, than doing, they're doing now. I think that's the BCA's job. I think I'm going to propose as a select board that we re we reject the Chittenden Washington one district as as proposed because it's not in the best interest of Waterbury. Is the motion a letter to be I think, yeah. I'm not yeah. sure. I don't know why they need to make a recommendation. They are part of the BCA. They should really. Well, they, because I think that, I think the board, just like we said in the last issue, represents the town of Waterbury. The board can make a determination that it's in the best interests or not of the, of the, of the town. They can communicate that to the BCA, but they're all members of the BCA. They're not bound by this particular vote. So if they go, if it gets approved by the select board three to two or two to, you know, if it's a two to two vote, that should be communicated. If it's a three to one vote, that should be communicated. But they're all members of the BCA and they don't have to live by what the board said when they vote as a BCA member. But I think they are the select board of the town and have the the right to say that we think this is not if 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 Mike thinks it's not in the best interest of the town, I think he has the right to make that motion and the the board can act on it. And their action gets transmitted to the BCA. And then at the BCA meeting, they're all BCA members and they're basically free agents. Does the motion have an action? We didn't have a second though. We didn't really have a motion. We didn't have a motion. I, I made a motion. Well, what I don't think you made a second. I propose. Okay. <laughs> I I propose. No, that you make a motion. Is, I make a motion <laughs> that the Waterbury Select Board recommend to the Board of Civil Authority that we reject the proposed Chittenden Washington One uh, District as. Passed to us by the legislature. You're rejecting Chittenden Washington one or the overall plan? <laughs> I think the overall plan. Or the, yeah. The proposed, the proposed the plan. Yeah. I'll second that motion. Further discussion? Yes. What is the um, proto how do we do it? Do I write it we write a draft letter and then Bill or Carly, you help us with it, and then how what do we I, I think yeah, I think Carl, I think if the motion passes, you can just send pass it. Carla to read the motion at the BCA meeting. I don't think okay. you have to write a, right. a okay. long letter or anything. Great. I just think that you can have the clerk transmit the motion to the to the BCA, and then if you're there, if you folks go, I mean, I, no one can compel you to go, but you are all members of the BCA, and and this is. BCA meeting and there's something of importance to do, uh, you know, you can discuss it all then. But I don't think you have to write a big letter. I think you just transmit yeah. your motion to the to the BCA. Great. I can do that. Thanks, Kyle. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any additional discussion? All those Mark, is, yeah. yes, please. Um, is it uh, worth considering uh, amending that and saying that uh, uh, disapprove of the action uh, because of the loss of 700 or so whatever the count is uh, voters from from Waterbury yeah I mean I, I was wondering if we need to say something more detailed and that just to specifically the how they divided the downtown region um, but I don't I don't know I think that's a friendly amendment to my motion that we object to the, the, 
the 750 person division of our community. Okay. Yeah, the loss of 750 out of the. Out of. So you could say, you could say something to the effect, um, you know, while we understand Waterbury may lose um, influence in the legislature if we move from a two member district to a one member district. We, however, object to how the lines are drawn to accomplish the two single member districts um, and, and then hash it out from hash it out from there. Yeah, but you need to make sure that they know that they're I mean, they might just draw the line so that 700 people from some other part of Waterbury get chopped out. Um, I think. Well, need, yeah, um, and you can say that the, the two districts if there are going to be two districts where Waterbury represented, where Waterbury residents are represented, the district should be as close to 43, you know, to the ideal number as possible. So, and, and Bill, because there's no way if, there, if we move from a single member district, I mean, from a two member district to a single member district, not all Waterbury can be in in a single member district. So, um, the 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 legislature would allow probably 46 or 4,700 in in a single member district. Watery has 5,300 people or 5,200 people. So all of Watery cannot be in one district. Um, uh, you're going to have to carve it up somehow, but it would be best to carve it up such that Waterbury, that both districts were as as big as possible. So Bill, I, I don't know that the board tonight has to have that level of detail in their motion. Right. When the BC meet, BCA meets on Thursday, we'll be having that discussion and whatever we decide as a board. Yeah. And we, I think we, we help, we'll send a detailed response to And I think proposal. I'll be present at the BCA. Danny said she's gonna be at the BCA. I don't know if Mark, I don't know. I know we Chris. have to warn that if there's more than two of us. No, you're just part of the BCA. Okay. No, we're part of the BCA, so yeah. it's not really. It's already warned as a, B, a BCA meeting. Okay. Right. Uh, so yeah, I think there'll be enough then. Yeah. I think we could more fully describe that. So I want to move the question. Yeah. All right. It's been moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. <coughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Thanks. If the board is okay, can we get, can we move Linda up to now so she can jump off? Well, because we have two people that are here too, so the folks for the Act 250 discussion. We so have a member of the planning commission to me too, we're all waiting. Oh, oh yeah. that was actually Right, right. right. sorry about that. Yep. I think um, there are three people, so. Okay. Discuss Act 250 jurisdiction. Um, this is a continued discussion about the idea of moving Waterbury from a one acre to a 10 acre um, town that basically takes some projects and pushes it towards Act 250. Um, to remind the board, we had a group approach us with concerns on a project they're working on, but I think that this is a larger concern for Waterbury. We've heard it from other projects. Paros is one that I quickly think of, but I know there's been other projects. Um, is do we have any? Did Alyssa? Yeah. Alyssa well, could not take it work. Okay. She had a court conflict. Okay. But, um, Steve Garcher is here from the Okay, come on. Great. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess if if we could get the Planning Commission to give their comments on on it, I mean, basically, we elected as a town to become, what, when was that that we elected? Like 2013. And it seemed like the reasoning behind that was concern that we could not handle projects that were larger. Well, the only option is one or 10, right? There's no in between, right? So at least maybe the concern in 2013 was the inability of town to be able to handle projects of that size and their impacts. And so it was voted that we, elect, we elected to become a one acre town uh, but we can remove that election as far as we're being told as a board, correct? Well, let me, I'll, I'll go first, and you may want to get Steve to give more input. 
Uh, <clears throat> so that's correct that um, when we enacted subdivision bylaws as a chapter of the zoning regulations, um, normally we would have become a 10 acre um, town with a 10 acre threshold for uh, commercial and industrial projects, but um, the state statute allowed us to pass an ordinance that kept us at a one acre town. Uh, the threshold for residential properties did, did change. So the select board at the time felt that um, there were just um, you know, unanswered questions as far as our bylaws and the uh, ability to cover those criteria in Act 50, which um, weren't, weren't covered in our, our bylaws. So that, that was, I think, the, kind of the um, brief version of, of how the um, select board felt at the time. Um, our bylaws have not changed. The site plan review criteria and the conditional use criteria are still limited. Um, the Planning Commission had a wide range of views. I, I want to encourage Steve to come up and give you his input, but um, they're concerned. One concern is having a policy change based on um, a, a relatively small number of projects that are impacted, though they certainly understand the, the impacts um, and the uh, concern regarding some of the Act 250 criteria input by um, Agency of Natural Resources on natural resource criteria uh, impact or um, input that the Division for Historic Preservation provides when historic districts are involved or historic uh, buildings are involved. So, um, so there was a wide range of views on the Planning Commission. But I think the best thing to move the conversation would be maybe see if you'd like to see, and then um, we could go sure. from there. And then if you have any questions for me, I'd be okay. glad to respond. Come on, so, no. sure. Thank you. So first of all, I, I'm not speaking for the Planning Commission. It was sure. pretty clear um, that, that the commissioners mostly felt that um, we really didn't have the, the, the background or the time at this point to really dive into this and, and understand all the implications. So I will say there was a, there was a wide variety of, of, um, of opinions um, among the folks. Uh, some expressing, uh, I think, a desire to, to be able to utilize Act 250 to kind of um, enhance the ability of Waterbury to, to, to make sure that things have gone through uh, appropriate levels of review. Um, so some of the things that the DRB may not um, be able to, to kind of really jump into in the same way that uh, an Act 250 would, would require it. Um, on the other hand, and, and, and personally, um, I feel that when we get down to a one, a one acre, um, we're, we're looking at, at development that's, that's very small. We've got relatively few 10 acre um, plots that are really or, or between one and ten, sure. um, that would be subject to um, subject to this this regulation, um, and that being uh, being an outlier doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, that we have a DRB, we have a, a pretty effective DRB um, that can that can go through whatever processes can ask for the kind of reviews that um, that, that would make a, a project um, sensible for for us without having to rely uh, on the Act 250. So uh, again, my, my personal view is, is, is to, to move back to a 10, it makes sense. That's my personal view. Again, the, the Planning Commission really came from all sides on this and, and isn't prepared to say, we think and we've been able to think through this in, in a really well-studied way. Yeah. In the beginning, your first comment, can you give an example of what that might be that Act 250 might do that right now isn't within our current kind of yeah i think one of the examples was some of the environmental reviews that that might be required that act 250 would uh, would um would, would perhaps be more experienced in in applying um uh, you know i don't i don't remember the details there was a, a good example do you recall um yeah i don't really have an example steve of a specific Project, Not a project, but, but if something were in, you know, shoots for wildlife corridor or something of that nature, where you know there there are some serious wildlife uh, questions. You know, we have conditional use criteria with no undue adverse impact on natural resources, but.
but it's a very broad criteria. I think the other one I mentioned was uh, impacts to historic districts or historic buildings where you might have a proposal to demolish an historic building or you have a building that's going in in, a, in an historic district adjacent to historic buildings. We, uh, other than in the downtown area where there are almost no uh, lots that are over an acre, um, we, we really have very limited uh, ability to um, review under that criteria. It's just no undue adverse impact to uh, historic sites. So uh, that's a pretty high bar. So those are two examples. You could have a, uh, a project with traffic impacts, for instance, where we're limited in our review, but on sites of one to 10 acres, that's typically not a, not it, a huge issue. Yeah, generally, it was an anxiety about the level of expertise that we have locally versus the level of expertise that, that might be brought to a review if it went through Act 250. Um, okay. And should, I mean, should one of those situations arise and the DRB needed to, are there boards or, or resources that the DRB could then recruit to follow up with expertise that they don't have? Well, I think we have a lot of expertise in, in house, and the yeah. DRB has a lot of expertise. There's an historic preservation consultant right. on the DRB and an architect and so on. But I think the issue more has to do with our criteria. So, you know, there's, there's some risk. I think it's a, an issue of whether, you know, we take a bit of risk and we um, encourage uh, or, or have less cost and less um, review time that, that these um, people who are developing these sites have to go through. I mean, that's definitely a consideration for economic development. So I think that's, that's really it. But it has to do more with the criteria than our level of expertise. I think as a town of 5,000, we have a lot of expertise in, in our, uh, and as Steve mentioned, the, the DRB is generally very good, but in some cases their, their hands are a bit tied, that's all. Mm -hmm. I want to echo which Steve just said. I think I know as a former DRB person, I think there's an extraordinary amount of talent on our DRB that can look at a lot of these projects fairly intelligently, and they, along with the you know, planning department, can ask for different you know, studies, if, if, should they wish. I know they have in the, in the past asked for studies on, on different things. They've asked for, you know, when there's been you know, the high, uh, like no, thank you. Thank sure. you. you know, we, we have had some visual impact, you know, you know, studies. So they can ask for various things. So I'm just saying, I think we have the expertise. I, I would hate to deny a lot of, have a lot of good projects, maybe not go forward because the expense on these Act 250 reviews are huge. And I'm not saying they, they wouldn't be asked to be doing some things the same thing that the Act 50 folks are going to ask for, the DRB or the planning department may ask for those same things. So I'm kind of leaning in favor because of our expertise and what we, we can do. I think you know, we, we, we've got to enable our folks, in my opinion. Chris, do you have... Yeah, I lost you guys there for a minute um, trying to figure out without asking again what the short version of what's going on it sounds like uh you're looking to put some of the control of act 250 uh protocol in in the drb's hands am i correct right now we we elected in 2013 to be a one acre town so projects uh, what are the like specifically commercial a commercial industrial project commercial right. industrial projects non one acre but under 10 in other communities that haven't elected, they can take those projects to their DRB. In our town right now, because of the election in 2013, the select board is sent, are sending basically every project over one acre into Act 250 because of that election. So what's being discussed is that we remove that election and return to a 10 acre town um, and what impact basically the discussion is what impacts would that cause and should it be considered right and it's Mark, just to make sure everybody just to make sure everybody understands it's a it's a two-step process now you've got to go to the drb anyway and and then you have to go to act 250 so if you change the um 
the ordinance that was adopted in 2013, it will allow the DRB to, um, to you know, hold a hearing and, and vet these projects, as Mike indicated, using the expertise that they have. And you know they can they can apply some of the um, Act 250 criteria and get to the get to the bottom of it. So it really it it uh, truncates the system for the developer. It's a it's one stop as opposed to two. And um, the the frustrating part, and I know there's people there to speak to it, is that the um, you know. The Act 250, if you keep the current situation in place, uh, the Act 250 doesn't even have to recognize the DRB's work. They can they can ask for it all over again. Uh, so uh, it would it would be helpful from a development point of view. And from speaking personally and talking with Steve, I think we have. Uh, much more capacity now. We've had a DRB for a number of years now. At the time in 2013, we had much more recently moved away from the ZBA planning commission process, which was also a two-step process. Uh, the DRB has a lot more experience under its belt now dealing with these kind of things. So um, that that's really the issue. It sounds like I talked to Alyssa and she mentioned, and maybe you can confirm this, that the work that's being done on the zoning rewrite could potentially, even if we were to vote in favor of removing the election, any concern over maybe, I don't know what the term would be, but for the zoning rewrite to have additional items in there to address any concerns for projects of this size, the DRB, I mean, sorry, the Planning Commission could work that into it, knowing that the, the number of parcels that this really includes and the timing, I don't think there's a lot of risk there from what seemed like Alyssa said in the conversation we had, Steve. So it seems like she understood the conversation and, and why you know we're, we're addressing this. And I know that there's that, um, the Waterbury Area Economic Development Group is talked about this for years about concerns we heard over other projects that either got off the ground or never got farther because of, I, yeah, I hate to think that these, these projects that are of a smaller scale are deeply impacted financially that, you know, who knows how many projects just haven't been considered because. Look at, look at just in, before us, the Paros project, they probably incurred just with the Act 250 review over fifty thousand dollars in in costs, and a lot of projects are going to say, "No, we're not going to do it. Go someplace else or do something else." And when and that scale, it's not like you're amortizing that over a large project. Okay. Exactly. I think that's a problem. Um, there is there is one thing that you need to understand, and Steve right now is in a better position to explain this than I, um, and it's all about process. Um, even if you want to do this, it will take it will take at least I think you know sixty days plus to get this accomplished because you have an ordinance on the books. Um, repealing an ordinance is considered an amendment to an ordinance, and the 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 appeal process or the amendment process is the same as if you were ad adopting an ordinance. So. Um, you can uh, make a motion at some point to repeal this ordinance if you want to do that. And then you have to uh, publicize your decision. The public has a, a period of time in which they can decide to circulate a petition, uh, which would require you to hold a special town meeting to see if the public wanted to overturn the decision that you made. Uh, if that doesn't happen, uh, the new ordinance or the new lack of an ordinance, if you will, uh, takes effect, I believe, 60 days after your vote. And I know Steve sent me an email earlier today. I wasn't able to read it, Steve, until just before the meeting started. So I don't know if you shared that with the select board at all, but you might want to just 
make sure from a process standpoint that everybody knows uh, what to expect going forward if the board wants to, in fact, change this rule. Right, Bill, I think you, uh, you said it very well. Um, the um, state statute requires the same process for the repeal of an ordinance as the enactment of the ordinance. And um, my understanding is it can be repealed with an, an action of the select board at a warned meeting. And then uh, you probably would need to warn that, that repeal. And then <clears throat> it does have to be posted in at least five conspicuous places. Uh, and then um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's formally uh, public, publicized or published. And then um, so in the newspaper, and then uh, does become effective 60 days after this date of repeal. And uh, there is the option of a petition that would take it to a vote. I don't know that that would happen. Uh, I kind of doubt it, but uh, there's that option in, in statute. So I think you represented it well, Bill. I'm really reiterating what you said, but uh, that's correct. Does, did Dave Rue suggest that they needed to warn? Um, you know, I've always taken the position that the select board uh, doesn't need to hold a public hearing in order to, uh, to adopt an ordinance. They can just adopt it. Um, but it probably would be safer if you warned the fact that you're going to repeal this at your next meeting on the 15th of November, take action that night, and then the clock starts ticking at that point. And, um, you know, but I just want everybody to understand you can't just repeal this and tomorrow we have, uh, you know, we're a 10 acre town. It, it, it takes a process. Yeah, I would advise that too, Bill. I think that would be a, the best approach. Then it's, it's warned as a repeal. And um, yeah, that would be good. So then do we just put that on the agenda for that meeting? We don't need to make a motion other than just any discussion we have tonight, right? But it would be a separate warning specific to this about discussion. It would just be an agenda item, select board, consideration by the select board of repealing such and such an ordinance and just put that on the agenda. And you don't really have to make a motion. You can just kind of express that's your intent and we'll make sure it's on the next agenda. I'm for that. I'm also for that. I'm for that as well. Chris and you think that there's risk in, I mean, this was on the Warren Select Board meeting a discussion on Active 50. You, you just think that we weren't specific enough on our agenda tonight to be able to? Well, you know, the, the risk is if somebody's going to object to it. Um, and I've, I've stated in the past that I believe, I believe, and I'm not a lawyer, but I think if the select board took this action tonight to repeal that ordinance, that uh, the clock would start ticking. Um, but, you know, and, and who's going to object uh, if, if no one objects to it in a timely basis? They, you know, everything is going to have to be publicized. Um, but we don't even have the, I don't know if Steve has the ordinance with him tonight or not, but um, we will have to reference in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the language that has to be posted, the fact that the particular ordinance was, was appealed. I, I know there's, there's people out there who are concerned about timeliness. Uh, and again, from my perspective, if we waited and said, we're going to warn this on the 15th, um, they can take the risk if they want to start their project or, you know, go to the DRB. They haven't been to the DRB yet. There's going to be some process there. So I don't know how how important these next 15 days really are. From my perspective, if, uh, 
if a developer is banking on you have to do this tonight and they don't have to worry about it or in in two weeks if they have to worry about it i would be i would be careful about doing it tonight if if those two weeks really made it a real big difference because you wouldn't want to get yourself in hot water so I guess given that Steve reached out to David Rue and he suggested it needs to be on the agenda, I would lean that direction. Yeah, let me just follow up and then I know Doug, can you want to say something? Yeah, I would I would strongly recommend that you put it on the agenda as a repeal. We cite the ordinance. It also gives planning commission members an opportunity to come and speak if they want to speak. Okay. Um, and I think it's just good process. Okay. Um, the project is coming to the Development Review Board. It's um, warned for, I think, the 17th. 17th. Yeah, so it's, it's in process. So uh, anyway, that would be my recommendation. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Duncan McDougall, um, and the project that we're talking about in particular is for the Children's Literacy Foundation. And just as a little background, it's a 1.3 acre project. It's in the old plateau property, kind of across from uh, Coal Hollow Cider Mill. Um, and this uh, issue is of great import to us um, because as a small organization, um, having to go not only to the DRB, which everyone needs to do, but also to go through Act 250 is, is, are two major hurdles. Uh, and the Act 250 hurdle adds significant cost significant time. I would guess the Act 250 right now is backed up given all of the projects that are going on and significant risk. Um, and I know that the Select Board and the Planning Commission um, want to encourage organizations, small, medium-sized organizations to come to our community. And this is a, a significant impediment. And there are gonna be some organizations that look at two different towns and say, this is you know, a 10-acre town, I just need to go to the DRB versus one acre town have to go through the whole Act 250 process, and they make, make their decisions that way. And I certainly don't um, disagree with the fact that Act 250 has greater expertise and experience on certain issues, but the question is, you know, for a small project, are these things that you actually need? You know, it's a poor analogy, but off the top of my head, I was thinking, you know, if you had a small town incident, and in certain towns, if you had that incident, you had to go to the FBI. You know, most incidents in a small town don't re require going to the FBI. They have greater expertise than our local police force, but most of the small town incidents don't require that. When you do need to, you have the ability to ask for their insight and all of that. And I feel like this is just using a heavy hammer on a small project. And it, it's gonna impact the interest of small and medium sized organizations wanting to come to our town. Waterbury is one of three towns in the whole state that has gone down this path. It has subdivision regulations and is a, uh, a one-acre town. And I guess the question is, is our, select, is our um, planning commission, our DRB, are they well behind all the other towns that have gone down this path? I would guess they're probably significantly ahead. So it hasn't negatively affected the other towns as far as I can think of. So I, I think the risk to Waterbury of taking this step is small. Uh, I totally understand the desire to wait until the 15th to make sure you have all your T's crossed and your I's dotted, and we'd prefer that because we want this to happen. I'm not sure it's an issue, a burning issue, that would cause a lot of people to want to start petitions and all of that. And if we know that you're going down this path, that's fine. We're just, we're gonna go to the DRB as we were planned, and we're just gonna assume, perhaps incorrectly, but hopefully not, that uh, this will move forward. And we very much appreciate you considering this. It's a, it's a big issue for us. I know it's not a huge issue for, for you know, everyone because only a certain number of people have this interest, but um, because of that, I'm not sure it's a huge risk to take the step because it's not a lot of people that are gonna be in this situation. Yeah. So, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Yeah, and I think it's important that I don't, I don't approach this as this is specific to one project if the recommendation is that we warn and um, move this to the next meeting in a more appropriate manner, I think that's fine. So um, I don't think we'd have to make any motion at this time. So. I agree. Okay. okay. All right. Great. Sounds good. Thank All right. you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um,
I am going to, the next thing was going to be parking issues. I'm going to move internet forward. Linda, thank you for your patience. Thank you for this opportunity on such short notice. I'd like to thank the chair for putting us on the agenda tonight. Um, last week, uh, Christopher Shank and I uh, were approached by Memorial Fiber Net um, with a proposal to join their uh, broadband efforts as well. Uh, we uh, got together this afternoon, as a matter of fact, with the CP Fiber um, officers and had a discussion with them about it. And we all kind of came to the conclusion that it would be advantageous for Waterbury that Christopher and I become delegates on both the CV Fiber and the Lamoille County, um, the Lamoille uh, Fiber Net, so that um, we could uh, assess more the proposal that Lamoille County is bringing forth. Basically, it boils down to uh, being uh, in the CV fiber. We are at the end of the line for getting uh, wired broadband, whereas Lamoille County is offering us a much shorter uh, span to before we get the, the entire town, as a matter of fact, wired. So that we would like to explore that proposal. We think it would be better for Waterbury. So what I, I'm asking is, um, that you agree to put, uh, allow uh, Christopher and I to be on the Memorial uh, Fiber Net board as well as where we are on the CD uh, Fiber board. <laughs> Linda, and they, their board is coming up on Thursday to talk about us and, and um, we'd like to be able to say that we are in favor. Linda, is it is it similar to what we had to do last time where we actually elected to join the district or the C we had to like we had to elect to join cv fiber we need to elect to join lamoille fiber yeah. which would then allow you to take those positions right that's right because right now we can't get enough detail on the project they're proposing for us huh. bill do you have any comments uh no not really um I think that it seems like Linda is saying that you've talked to the folks at the CV Fiber Board and they don't have a, a problem with Waterbury being a member of both uh, organizations. That's right. Well, I, I trust Linda to be telling you the truth about that. If they don't have a problem with us being a member of two organizations, and if Lamoille doesn't have a problem with us being a member of two organizations, I don't see there's any reason why we shouldn't do it, especially if Linda and Christopher both are gluttons for punishment that they want to go to two of these meetings. <laughs> I, I have six meetings already just with TV Fiber, and this is going to add another three. <laughs> so if, if I didn't think it was worthwhile, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> God bless you. Yeah, I was going to say the burden's yours, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> I Linda. really want to bring the best alternative to Waterbury. So over the next month or so, once I become more familiar with what Lamo uh, Fiber is offering us, I will bring it back and we can make more discussion in detail on that. Linda, the one question I have is, and does this create a conflict of interest of you being on both both I, I asked that myself this afternoon mm -hmm. and uh, CV Fiber said no, because we're both drawing from the same pot of money, both, both uh, CUVs, CUCs, CUTs, whatever they call them. They're both uh, drawing from the same pot of money. And so it just depends on uh, if the installation fee's got to go to uh, one or the other, in other words. And they didn't see there was any conflict there um, between us. Linda, one one other question, and then I think we can probably get this moved forward. Um, now, getting getting wires up quicker is one thing. Do will we have clarity from both sides on user fees and costs, and is that taken into consideration as you might 
come to the board with a proposal. I don't even know how this works necessarily fully in terms of like when, you know, now that we're part of these, we're part of CB Fiber, if we also now join Lamoille and Ward Foam can start putting these networks into place or these wired networks into place, um, do you have clarity before that happens and exactly where costs are going to be from a user perspective? And is there any way to have clarity on that before? It just seems a little crazy that. We, we, uh, we talked about a subscription price this afternoon, and um, the, the, the two estimates from both of them are really close together, uh, depending on how much the subscriber decides he wants, how much bandwidth he wants. But uh, they were both offering something in the $55 a month range. Also, if you wanted more, you could get a $75 a month. Uh, subscription type thing. So um, it's going to be pretty much in the same range as far as our subscribers are concerned. We I are think, trying to get the best price for our subscribers. Right. That's for but, sure. Yeah, for I, think sure. The, I think the big thing to remember is that uh, neither one of these organizations can, um, can raise tax money or can compel the town to pay for something uh, through its tax base. Um, and I think we're in a position here that um, if we do um, authorize joining the Lamoille County Fiber Organization and appointing um, Linda and Christopher to, their, to the boards, then I think Linda and Christopher have the unique position of being able to kind of weigh what's best for Waterbury. And I think that um, what I'm hearing is that while subscription costs are important, um, it seems like they've already kind of indicated they're, they're kind of talking to the same installers and the same people I'm sure about yep. how they're gonna build the, build the infrastructure. So the costs there are gonna be relatively similar if joining Lamoille can push us up on the ladder in terms of when we can actually see lines going up in Waterbury, that might be best. So I think it's a, a unique opportunity to let Linda and Christopher really work hard to see what's the best deal for Waterbury. And I'm sure uh, given both of their um, interests and desire for this uh, CD for this uh, fiber optic uh, alternative to be available, I think that they'd probably do that uh, quite well. So I don't see a problem with it. Yes. Does this have to be two separate motions, one to join Lamoille and another one to appoint them to? I don't, I don't think so. I think you can do it and you know, you can, I, I think you can do it all in one motion. So I move that Waterbury join the Lamoille Fiber Net organization group um, and I'll appoint Linda and Christopher as our representatives. Is there a second? Lamoille Fiber Net? I think that's what Linda said, but she can clarify. Yes, that's right. Okay. Great. Second. Second. I think you should also just put while remaining. Mm -hmm a member of CB Fiber in there, so it's clear that you haven't left that other organization. Good right, point. we will be a member of both is yeah. what we're asking. Are we okay with the amendment? Yes. Totally. Okay. Um, any further discussion, Chris? Do you have anything? No. Um... <laughs> you know, like I said before, the, the major uh, utilities are going to be the, the hampering issue in this you know, with manpower and availability and product and whatnot, but you got to start somewhere. So at least she's, she's uh, looking into a, a good possible option that may, may get things done quicker. This, this option has two benefits that I see. One is it, they told us it could be as, as much as two years sooner. No, no kidding. Yeah. And and it will cover the entire town of Waterbury, not just the undersubscribed. 
That's great. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Um, Linda, thank you very much for everything you're doing, and thank Chris as well, and we're excited, and that's, I think this is excellent news, and negotiate us a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> Internet now, uh, one of the things I asked them this afternoon is, you, do, you guys got the lawyers to deal with this, right? <laughs> and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for your trust in me and Christopher. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Linda. Thank you for your patience tonight, too. Well, okay. I was really interested in every single one of those topics you had on the agenda tonight. So thank you. I'm on the, uh, uh, I'm a justice of the peace. I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Um, all right. Next is parking issues. There's two that I'd like to discuss. Um, and we can talk in more detail at a, a later meeting, but I also wanted to discuss it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, one is, uh, Sweet Road, I uh, was reached out to by a community member that's, I think, probably had issues with parking at the Hunger Mountain uh, Trailhead for years. Um, and what, if anything, from a town's perspective, we can do to address those issues, similar to probably what we talk about at the end of Lush Hill. Yeah. And then the other one was, uh, I don't know if all the select board members got it, but Gary Dillon reached out about um, the parking, and I've seen it myself, where there's cars queuing up on Stowe Street in the, in the area that's labeled no parking, but it's they're just camped there. Um, so, um, Bill, I don't know if you want to take it from there and let us know what, as a select board, we should be considering there, or if you want to try to discuss this at the next venue with more detail. I just wanted to bring it up yeah. tonight. Well, um Take the second one first, the Stowe Street issue. Um, you know, there is already prohibited parking or timed parking in, in those places. And this has been an issue. And even when the village had a police department, it was still, it was still an issue. Uh, unless the police were up there every day to ask people to you know, move along or don't park here, um, people would would go there until the cop asked them to leave. You know, they're, can you, can you they're there. To, where there is on Stowe Street for the, in the vicinity of the school. Okay. So we're talking about Stowe Street, basically between uh, between Railroad Street and High Street um, on both sides of the street, and High Street as well. On High Street, you know, there's um, there's parking limited to residents only on the, on the side of the street that the houses are on. Uh, they're supposed to have permits if they're going to park there. Um, but people who are picking their kids up from school park on Stowe Street. They park on Union Street. They park on High Street. And they park on the wrong side of High Street, you know, where parking isn't even allowed. Um, and, you know, as I said, when, <clears throat> when the village had a police department, the police would go up there from time to time and they would ask people to move and people would move away. But if they weren't, if the cops weren't there, they were just going to say, well, I'm only going to be here for 15 minutes and then my kid's going to be in the car and I'm going to be out of here. So there's, there's no easy solution. Um, we can talk to the state police. Uh, I have made arrangements, not because of this issue, it just is coincidental, but Lieutenant White is going to be at your next meeting on the 15th. So if this is an issue, I know they, they don't want to write tickets, but maybe they could show up every once in a while and just tell people, you, you know, you can't park here um, and move them along. So we can have that conversation with Lieutenant White on that. Um, short of uh, hiring a civilian parking enforcement officer, which I think you have the authority to do. We have an ordinance. You could hire somebody, give them a ticket book, have them go out there and, and write tickets. And that's a, that's a way to enforce the ordinance. Uh, you don't have to be a sworn police officer to do that. But 
um, uh, that was mentioned. I, I brought that up at a, at a budget time. I think it was the first full year that Mike was on the board and the board said, now we really don't have the money. We don't want to spend the money for enforcement. So that's something that the board can revisit in a future meeting. The is there, Hunger Mountain situation is, yes, is, is well, before we, can move, we focus on that for real, real quick. Sorry. Sure, sure. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a benefit um, to talking to anyone at the school to see if um, there's help that they can give. It's not just a town issue, but it's particular to the school. And other, I know other schools work on their traffic flow, parking, timing, pickup, and I wonder if any of us or how to, how to start that communication and what their benefit might be versus just, talk, you know, relying on only police. Well, police. It, might be, it might be worthwhile to try to get the principal uh, engage the principal in a conversation, engage the principal and a couple of board members from the Howard Union board and have them come to a meeting and talk to them. Um, the last time I tried to address this issue, uh, you know, I went with police chief Joby Fischer and talked with the principal at the school, you know, face to face. It wasn't a board meeting. Um, and, you know, they've, they've tried to do what they can they have a much better handle on what happens on their grounds than they did before. But, you know, we still face issues. They make announcements, for instance, at, at uh, assemblies. I don't even know because of COVID if they're even doing assemblies right now. But, you know, if they had a, an assembly for holiday, um, you know, a music recital or whatever you want to call it, they would announce at the beginning of the meeting, you know, if you're parked on um, Armory Ave behind the school, if you're in a no parking zone, please move because, you know, the police are going to have to enforce the, the ordinance. But, um, you know, what happens in the street is really, I, I'm sure they would be willing to send out information or email out information. I don't think they believe in sending paper anymore. You know, when my kids were in school, they used to bring home stuff in their backpacks and, you know, hand it to us. But I think the school just communicates with parents by, by email now. So, you know, we can try to raise the level of this issue, but I think it's going to boil down to enforcement more than anything is if people can kind of get away with it, uh, they're going to get away with it. Um, so, so Bill, Bill. Are they, yeah. are they asking parents that that is the pickup location in the front? Is, are there any other solutions that have been considered or are people also picking up in the back? You just don't see it because I don't drive up Armory, but is it a free for all of like the school just opens its doors and the kids are everywhere? Or is it like, this is where pickup happens and there's just too much activity for that front parking lot pull in to yeah, handle? Um, the parking lot, the front parking lot, you know, that's where the buses go in. So it's been a long time since I've had school kids, but they, they try to minimize any kind of in and out picking up activity in, in there. The, the drop-off is, it's chaotic at drop-off time, but not quite as much because people are, dropping their kids off and leaving. So they get there, the kid gets out of the car and the parent leaves. The afternoon, you know, the parents want to be there when the kids come out. So there's a much bigger queuing effect on the streets because the parent, it's not like you just drive up and the kid walks out the door and jumps in the car. The parent has to be there before dismissal in order to have the kid find them. So it's really the, the dismissal time. Um, I, I can't answer the question mark right now, whether there's a lot of activity. My, my, my suspicion is there's not a lot of people parked on Armory Ave in the back. I think it's more High Street and uh, Stowe Street than anything else where the problem lies, but I don't know that for sure. 
is 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 there proper signage already there, Bill, or is there signage at all? I believe the signs are still there, but I I can I can see that, Chris. I, I like Danny's idea as a first step. Call me a hard ass. Give it a few tickets is going to solve more 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 problems. I know it's not a pleasant thing to do, but when pe people get a few tickets, that's going to resonate through the community and it's going to stop it. You know, people like to issue the tickets, Mike. Say please. I don't think they I don't think they will. You don't think why don't you think they will? That's part of their job to enforce, you know, I'm not saying if they have other things to do, they're going to run to you know, you know, school parking and stuff like that. But if they're not busy, and at that point in time, for them to go there, I don't think they're going to have a problem because it's going to be a pretty no-brainer ticket. You know, if they're I there, think they might. I think they might be willing. They, they might be willing to talk to people, but uh, I don't believe you were on the board, Mike, when we negotiated the contract. But the state was pretty clear that they are not going to issue municipal. Tickets Parking. on municipal ordinances. They're just not going to do it. Lisa, go ahead. Hi, folks. Um, I don't have any kids at Thatcher Brook Brookside right now. Um, but one of the reasons why there's so many parents that are dropping off and picking up is COVID. Um, these are children that can't be vaccinated. Um, the ridership on the buses right now is extremely low. Um, and that's for middle school and for, for primary school. So you've got a lot of families that don't want their kids riding the school bus. And so there's more people that are picking up and dropping off in person. Um, so I think that that's one of the, the contributing factors to the, the issue of there being a lot of cars in the morning and in the afternoon um, queuing up there. Okay. Thank you. I, I understand what you said, Lisa, but and I agree with you 100%. But why can't they have their kids go in the back and get picked up in the, in the parking lot? You know, to me, that's just a sign of laziness. You know, I don't see. Yeah, I, I don't understand what you mean. Go in the back. You, you can't just the, the children have to be supervised so that they come out the front door. And the principals, if you you should actually just go and, and watch dismissal someday. The principals come out. Everybody's got walkie talkies. Um, we've had pictures of it on our website of how it's like they bring the the kids out the the. Uh, principals and the teachers are looking at who's in the in the, the drive up loop. They see what parent it is. They're talking on their walkie talkie saying, you know, there's Johnny Smith. Where's Johnny Smith's mother is, is right here. Where's Johnny Smith? And they're like trying to move them as fast as they can to put the right kid in the right car to get the cars moving through the loop. Um, but there's no loop in the back of the school at the same time where there there's other, you know, if the parent, how do you know where the kid is and where the parent is for them to find each other? Um, everything is happening in that front loop and it's got a, it's a continuous traffic moving through and they try to move them as fast as they can and they're communicating in the moment. And, so, yeah. And, and that, that's, a, that's a big change. I, I'm not aware of that and I appreciate Lisa's insight because um, back before COVID and before the current administration and back when Wadbury had a police department, cars were just parked on the streets, the kids would be dismissed and they would just walk down the street and find their parent. The parents were not all moving into the front of the parking lot and going through that loop. The kids would walk out and the mother would have said, I'm gonna be on High Street or I'm gonna be on Stowe Street and they'd walk down there. So it sounds like they're taking an active role to try to move this queue a little bit quicker. And I know Gary, uh, Dylan, who is the one that reached out both to Mark and me, uh, is concerned about how do you get um, an emergency vehicle through uh, if there's if there these cars are all parked there. Um, and I know it's not an ideal situation, but my guess is that these cars are not unattended. It's not like somebody's parked and they've gone into the school and there's nobody there. So if, uh, if the fire truck is trying to come up the street, I think people can move their car. They can drive up the street and go around the block and come back. It's not ideal, but um, you know, the school is built in the most dense neighborhood that we have in the community. It, it was built in a time that probably 
70% of the kids that went to the school walked to school from home. There was no busing in the village at all. And if you lived on, you know, Wallace Street uh, or Butler Street down next to, uh, uh, you know, Zachary's Pizza, you, you walked to school every day. If you, were, if you lived down, you know, near the state complex, you walked to school. Now every kid gets bussed or picked up. And we can't move the school and put it in a place like where Crossett Brook is, where they have much more of space to maneuver around. They still have issues at Crossit Park too, I'm sure, but uh, I still it's think not it, an easy solution. I still think it warrants a conversation. I'd be happy to reach out um, to the principal. I used to live on High Street and it's not, it, yes, the fire emergency vehicle is an issue, but it's super unsafe. You can't see around the stop signs because people are parked. And I've been almost T-boned a number of, like terrifyingly close to dying in that intersection. And I don't live there anymore, so luckily I don't have that experience. But um, it's, it's really unsafe when people are parked all along both sides of that street. You can't see anything to turn out of there. So um, I know they're doing the, what they can, but I still think it warrants a conversation just to see what might be done to improve, so. <clears throat> yeah, I'd, I, I'd like to see maybe a more formal bill if you could I don't know if we need to make a motion, but if you could just reach out to the principal and let them know that I, I agree. I, I've been through there, and I think it is it is a lot. And I don't know if we can just ask that they try to come up with some solutions and challenge them. They know what the best, and, and I agree. I understand, Lisa, that there are extenuating circumstances that maybe will be fixed somewhat soon in terms of bus ridership. But, but even uh, like they have a crossing guard, like a traffic director or something, because yeah. just to help like assist someone out there for safety for 30 minutes could change the whole situation, I think. Yeah. So. Before we start trying to just come in heavy with tickets, I think, you know, I, I would, if I was in that position, I'd be like, well, what am I supposed to do? You know? yeah, where, do I go? <laughs> where do I go? So I don't know if we can just challenge the principal to try to see if they can come up with some solutions. I understand there's not a loop in the back, but maybe that's a longer term conversation that they can start now. Um, but I don't know if Bill, so, if you would, wouldn't mind just reaching out and letting them know that we're concerned about the safety and traffic around the school and if they can offer any additional conversation or solutions. So are you asking them to come to a meeting or are you just asking me to reach out to them and, and tell them if there's concerns and ask them to? Yeah, I think it, they don't need to come to a meeting, but if you could reach out to them with the, that we discussed it at our meeting and we have concerns and see where that takes takes us. Maybe a bill or a couple select boards. Yeah, I'd be happy to join mm -hmm. that conversation. So who's the school principal now? There are actually two. Um, there are co-principals, uh, Sarah Schoolcraft and Chris Neville. Um, I can send you a link. We did a story about them a couple weeks ago. Uh, the pictures were in the, in the paper. Um, and they're co-principals right now. I, I, I know Sarah. Yeah, and Chris uh, Neville, N-E-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, is the new um, co-principal. I mean, Mark, to your point here about, you know, not having them have to come to a meeting, you know, might not be a bad thing if they were willing to so that they could let us know and we could work as a group maybe to throw out some ideas as to how they might be able to mitigate this problem. Yeah, I mean, I think during that conversation, we, Start, could, we could yeah, go up there and meet at the Yeah, yeah I, I think school. just see where that conversation goes and say, well, you know, if it, we think it warrants bringing it to a meeting, we can, we can throw it on the agenda and have them join a larger discussion. That makes sense. Okay. Um, Sweet Road. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Sweet Road, you're right. That That is very much akin to the issue that we've had at the reservoir on Blush Hill. Um, this involves the Hunger Mountain Trailhead, a uh, very popular hiking spot. Um, especially, you know, summers and fall. Uh, Sweet Road is a relatively narrowish road, especially as you get over near the trailhead. Uh, a particular individual has 
put up signs in the highway right of way saying, you know, no parking, violators will be towed. Um, I wrote him an email and told him he needed to take those signs down. The town regulates uh, use and parking on the highways uh, and uh, you don't have the right to put up a sign, especially in the highway right of way. Uh, I don't know yet if the signs have been taken down or not, but when I had the exchange with him, you know, he said, okay, I understand what you're telling me, but what's the solution? Um, and unfortunately, part of the solution was never taken seriously by the state. Um, where the trailhead is um, and the parking lot for the trailhead, if you come back toward uh, Loomis Hill Road from where the trailhead is, there was, a, there was another parking lot that was there that was on private property that the uh, people used to allow folks to park in that lot as well. And they put that lot up for sale a number of years ago. When I say a number, I mean like 25 years ago. And at that time, you know, I wrote Forest Parks and Recreation and said, you know, the state ought to buy that. The, the parking area is too small and you can more than double your parking and the state didn't want to have anything to do with it. So they have the one trailhead lot there that's been in existence for a long time. And most days, especially uh, nice fall weekends, um, you can't get in the lot and people want to hike. So they just park their cars along the, the street or the, the roadway on, on both sides. Um, and there's a path. I, I live up in that neighborhood and I travel through the waterworks right up very often. And in a passenger car, you know, you can get through, even if there's cars parked on both sides, you have to go slow and you got to watch out for pedestrians. But some people up in that neighborhood don't like it. They think that it's dangerous. So the simplest solution would be to do what we did on Blush Hill, which is to make parking on one side only. But um, the cars are already, you know, I don't know um, how far along the roadway they're already going, but if you restrict it to one lane and people obey that, uh, you know, they're gonna probably be parked along I don't know, a half a mile or more of that road. Uh, and sometimes people don't like the fact that people are parking in the road in front of their houses. Uh, it's a public highway. There's nothing wrong with it, in my opinion. But that's, in a nutshell, that's the issue. There's not really built good clearance from the right, you know, for people to park on that roadway from the right of way. They're really getting way into the road. And I don't know if that's good, bad, or different. It's a, it's a what about the existing quarry there? Is there any possibility that, that some of that could be utilized? It takes some work from... Well, the, from I believe it's private property, Chris, right? Oh, the, the old quarry is? That's not part of that? I, I, think, that's, I think that's private property. Well, I, when I went to see Ed Stanick about opening that quarry for the town, he said, because uh, Forest and Parks controls it, that, that uh, we could open the quarry because uh, we didn't, it's under 10 acres, so we didn't need an Act 250 permit. Yeah. Well, you me. might be right. I, I, I'd have to look. I, I thought it was in, in private ownership. Um, but, you know, we, we can find that out quickly. And if it is in public ownership, if the, if the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation already owns that, then I think we should put pressure on them to, right. to develop additional parking because it's, it's not right to do what, what's being done there. Right. Um, Just like Flush Hill, it's, you know, they need more parking on both those areas. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and I, and I think if we if we reach out to the state and tell them our concerns, and you know they're not going to do anything on some, until somebody probably puts pressure on them, unless 
they feel really obligated to address it on their own. But I think I think it's worthwhile well, to. Dan, Dan Sweet's our assessor, and Dan Sweet lives right up the right up the road from there. So, uh, you know, Carla, when Dan is in on Thursday, if you can just ask him to look at, you know, you can probably do it yourself. Look at the property map. But if we find out that Forest and Parks owns frontage along the road, in addition to the parking lot that is developed already. If they own more frontage, we absolutely should put pressure on them to, to develop more parking there. And then hey, can you put the, put the work some of that COVID money? They, good idea, Chris. They, they own that quarry and they own quite a bit south mm -hmm. on, from, on that frontage on Sweet Road. I'll talk to Dan. All right. Well, if that's the case, then I think that should be our first uh, first overtures to them. Yeah, I, I'm fine with that. I, I, I do agree that I feel like that Blush Hill change really did start to make that a little bit more, even though it pushed traffic up the road, it made it a lot more navigable. I think safe. Works. I, I boat there a lot. And, um, you know, it's a drag when you have to walk you know, halfway up the hill to find a place to, you know, to, to get back to your car. But most people do pay attention to the, to the signs. Right around the cove itself, they don't. There are people that want to be close, but, uh, you know, that's kind of the most open part of the road. But as you come up the hill, most people are paying attention to the signs there on Blush Hill. On Sweet Road, people are about to climb a mountain. This yeah, like they're fine to walk. walk. <laughs> a little bit more. Maybe that's not too bad. Some and they're ready to walk. People are inherently ready. Is this a warm-up? <laughs> um, okay. okay. Anything Good, else? So you, you'll uh, potentially follow up with the state. You don't need a motion or anything? No. Okay. Um, anything else this evening? Thank you very much for attending tonight. Um, Just curious. <laughs> um, I will make a motion to adjourn. And next meeting is on the 15th? Yeah. Yep. Second the motion to adjourn. I make it. You thought you'd Oh, I will make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? <laughs> second. Let's use I. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Thank you all. Thanks. Good night. Have a good night.